Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dan Meltzer on the faculty here, and it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce to you General Mark Martins, who's one of our most distinguished graduates, an exceptional lawyer, and an exceptional public servant. Uh, Mark graduated first in his class from West Point, was a Rhodes Scholar, uh, and came here to Harvard Law School, from which he graduated also with distinction in 1990. And in the past 20-some years uh, in the military, he's had a broad range of distinguished postings. I won't mention every one of them except to say he's been in Kosovo, he's been in Iraq, he's been in Afghanistan, and many other locales. I do want to mention the last three postings that Mark has had because they're highly relevant to the topic that he's going to speak about today. In 2009, he was named uh, the co-leader of an interagency task force that President Obama set up to look at issues of detention policy for the federal government. As part of that review, he worked on uh, recommendations for the reform of the military commission process and worked with Congress in getting those uh, changes made in the Military Commissions Act of 2009. In 2010, he led the rule of law field force in Afghanistan which sought to extend the rule of law in that difficult area, both for the U.S. and coalition facilities and for the Afghan government. And for Mark, I know progress in Afghanistan, he always believed, depended on strengthening the democratic process in that country, and in particular, trying to establish and reinforce the rule of law, particularly in dealing with counterinsurgents. And then third, lastly, and most recently, Last June, he was appointed as the chief prosecutor of the Office of Military Commissions in the Department of Defense. And as I think uh, many of you know, um, for the detainees at Guantanamo, um, that office will now, at least for the time being, um, be essentially the exclusive federal prosecution office because Congress has precluded the use of Article III courts for criminal prosecutions of those detainees. And so um, General Martins has a, a large task ahead of him in dealing with the criminal cases for those detainees against whom criminal charges may appropriately be considered. Um, last year, for his distinguished service, General Martins became only the fourth person who received Harvard Law School's highest honor, the Harvard Law School Medal of Freedom. And it's a special personal pleasure for me because I knew General Martins, or Mark as he then was, as a student uh, in my class. He wrote a paper for me, which was a terrific paper. And then I had the chance again to work with him in 2009 when I was serving in the federal government and dealing with detention policy issues. Uh, and I can tell you that his striking achievements are married to an uncommon humility and decency, which makes him just altogether a wonderful collaborator. Um, he's um, going to speak for about 30 minutes. Uh, we'll then take questions, and he's asked me to request that although everything in his prepared remarks is totally public, that when we get to the question and answers, uh, we will do it on the basis that nothing that he says will be uh, for attribution. You can use the information, but it, no, nothing should be attributed to him in order to facilitate the freest possible exchange during the questions and answers. Let me close by just being very timely because um, uh, General Martins has just announced that he plans to make this his last posting in the Army and that he plans to retire in 2014. And he made that decision for a particular reason, which is to enable him to main maintain his position until then in the Office of Military Prosecutions to provide stability uh, and continuity in that office and also to avoid any possible suggestion that any decision that he might make would be done for the purpose of curring favor so that when he next comes up for promotion, that would be considered. Uh, so that this reflects something that I know he's going to talk about, his deep belief in the importance of establishing the leg legitimacy of the military commission system and he clearly has a very strong and abiding and personal commitment to that objective. So it's my great pleasure to present to you General Mark Martins. Thank you. 
Well, thank you, Dan. How's that? Just below my chin. Thank you, Dan, for that warm welcome. And I owe you so much. I'm indebted to you both formally for all that classroom instruction, regardless how much reading you gave us, and, um, but also informally for your stellar example while you were in government, learning so much from that example. Uh, it's good to be home. And, and I, uh, I absolve you, of course, of any mistakes that I make in the coming hour, despite all that priceful, uh, price, uh, pricey instruction that he gave. Um, my son was born here. I consider this home. Um, had the chance this morning to do physical training with some, some of the Harvard Law students who were here and uh, run along the Charles, still as great a study break as it ever was and just beautiful. And then uh, after physical training, PT, as it's known, uh, you know, had a walk down proverbial memory lane there. I was uh, coming past a intersection that I remember 24 years ago. I was riding uh, my bicycle in from Arlington. Kate and I had a, wife Kate and I had a, an apartment out in Arlington. I'm driving down a breakneck speed. I'm trying to get to torts class on time. Uh, and the ensuing events sort of made that appropriate. Uh, I, I, uh, I hit a slick spot. It wasn't a nice day like today. It was kind of rainy. So I hit some black ice, bald tires. I, I land on what, you know, in the military we call a fourth point of contact, my buttocks. And I slid for, you know, what must have been a, a, a city block. And I land at the feet of this really cute old elderly couple out walking their dog. And I'm there, you know, at their feet, and their dog comes up and licks me in the head. And uh, just an unforgettable time. I understand 15 years later, Dean, then Dean Elena Kagan created an ice skating rink. I can only think of what would have happened to my skating urge if that had come about. I know it wasn't because of my anonymous spill. And, uh, and so it's just, just wonderful to be home. I, I, someone told me that, you know, the juxtaposition of a general officer in full service dress and the image of someone sliding on their ass through an intersection could, could have been a source of humor. At least that was the theory. <laughs> so both classes that I've had the privilege to participate in today and this address are giving me a valuable opportunity to elaborate rather than merely restate what I believe are significant reforms in the military commission system that I first outlined in the American Bar Association Standing Committee on Law and National Security last December Harvey Rishikoff here, the chair of that committee, great friend Harvey Rishikoff invited me to make that statement, and to the New York City Bar Association in January. To summarize the defense that I began in Washington and New York, I acknowledge up front that despite having been long a part of the American experience at the intersection of armed conflict and law enforcement, military commissions are controversial in many circles. In fact, there are some people and organizations whose minds have already been made up to oppose them. I also acknowledge that the systems of military commissions attempted in 2001 by presidential order and in 2006 by initial legislation were flawed. Pause. They were flawed. And that's not where we are anymore. The reforms subsequently incorporated into the 2009 Military Commissions Act have resulted from action by all three coordinate branches of our government. While appreciating the criticisms and concerns, we believe that these reform military commissions are fair and that they serve an important role in the armed conflict against Al Qaeda and associated forces. There's increasing evidence in opinion surveys and legislative actions and resolutions, both in Congress and at state and local level, that the American people support reformed military commissions as part of our country's overall counterterrorism and justice institutions. Now, despite recent successes against Al Qaeda and associated forces, who, by the way, are identified as enemies not merely by the executive branch, but also by Congress in the Authorization for Use of Military Force of 2001, these elements continue to pose a serious and adaptive threat. They are irregular, shifting non-state actors who purposefully attack civilian populations, cleverly employ widespread new technologies, and patiently plot in the shadows of international boundaries and ungoverned terrain. By both scorning 
and cynically invoking the law for refuge, they tempt even peaceful peoples to respond outside the law. Such responses are a serious mistake, however. Despite our enemy's tactics, we must always operate in the space defined by the law and by our values. If we treat the law as a luxury, we sacrifice legitimacy. I don't believe that I am overstating the threat we face or the importance of how we respond. Our approach should be relentlessly empirical and pragmatic while demanding compliance with law. All instruments of our national power and authority, including law enforcement, military force, and certain combinations of the two, must be used to oppose these modern asymmetric threats. My focus today is on how America's widely respected system of military justice, and specifically its version of the common law jury, and the rules of procedure and evidence associated with the military jury, selection and decision making, offers a lawful and pragmatic process for confronting modern international terrorists who violate the law of war. I specifically address the claims that officer juries are insufficiently independent to render their verdicts. Rather, as I describe in what follows, a set of popularly supported reforms have improved and now protect from harmful influences the officer jury panel that is at the heart of military commissions for members of Al-Qaeda and that has always been at the heart of courts martial for United States service members. I propose today that if observers will withhold judgment for a time, the system they see will prove itself deserving of public confidence. Reformed military commissions are not the special, separate, and exclusive terror court that some have sought and others have feared. And that is because these military commissions are fully integrated within our federal framework of criminal justice are overseen by our Article III appellate courts and are strictly and properly confined to their law of war jurisdiction. Now, Harvard Law School is no stranger to military justice. As one of the most important figures in establishing our modern military justice system was Harvard's own Professor Edmund M. Morgan. Eddie Morgan, as he was called by friends, served as the chair of the committee to establish a uniform code of military justice at the request of Secretary of Defense James Forrestal following World War II. Many of Professor Morgan's original papers are right, right here in Langdell, just upstairs on the fourth floor. I was there a couple hours ago going through them, two big boxes of all of the papers, that, of his personal papers relating to the committee. And if you just talk to the curator of modern manuscripts and archives, they'll pull them in from their uh, off-site location and, bring them in for you. Professor Morgan and the committee held widely advertised regional public hearings in 10 different cities across the country. They analyzed hundreds of responses to an extensive questionnaire that had been distributed to a sample of officers of all ranks, as well as enlisted men and civilians. They followed up with numerous queries to the Department of Defense and of the separate military services. They were given a free hand. Professor Morgan's committee made bold and effective use of that free hand because millions of conscripted service members who had returned from World War II were committed to changing the court-martial system they had seen and that they had seen for themselves during the war. The greatest generation had not liked what it saw, and the reform system that these war veterans pressed their elected and public officials for is yet another lasting and incalculable contribution they made to our country. Among the leading criticisms of the old system were that there were not enough officers properly trained in court-martial duty, that defense counsel were often ineffective because of lack of experience and knowledge or lack of zealousness, and that procedures and outcomes varied widely across the uniformed services. But the most prevalent criticism and one that echoed centuries of civilian mistrust of military tribunals was that domination of the system by commanders made it incapable of doing real justice or of being widely perceived as just. The new Uniform Code of Military Justice that Congress passed in 1950 
upon hearing the committee's recommendations, addressed those and other criticisms in 140 articles that comprehensively modernized a system unchanged in many respects over the previous three centuries of British and American military experience. And if you go up and look in the archives, you can kind of see it evolving and see the different iterations, how these 140 articles took shape. The UCMJ, as it came to be called, fixed the qualifications of those who could serve on courts martial as trial and defense counsel, making it mandatory for these officers to have been admitted to legal practice in the federal courts or the highest courts of a state. True to its name, it established uniform procedures across all military services. And it codified a host of large and small changes to counter the problem of command domination. One major innovation was to establish a civilian court of military appeals, which was empowered to supervise, review, and set aside findings and sentences adjudged by courts martial. Another was to make it unlawful and punishable for anyone, including a commander, to attempt to coerce or influence any court martial jury member with respect to their findings or sentence or any law officer, judge, or counsel with respect to their military justice functions. These reforms in military justice that Professor Morgan led paralleled in many ways the model code development underway during this period in our history affecting civilian, state, and federal criminal law, criminal procedure, and the law of evidence. And in fact, Professor Morgan was one of the foremost authorities in the law of evidence and was part of a lot of that model code development. Professor Morgan was joined by others who pushed reforms leading to increasingly higher professional standards, to expansion of rights for service personnel, and to adoption of civilian procedures while preserving the command authority necessary for effective and accountable forces. What then are the defining features of modern United States courts martial or military commissions? These are tribunals formed under uniform procedures and with statutorily prescribed membership on a case-by-case -case basis as needed. The formation of a court martial or military commission is done by a convening authority who under the UCMJ is a military commander responsible for accomplishment of assigned missions, but also for the discipline, morale, and welfare of the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines entrusted to the commander's leadership. The convening authority for military commissions is not a commander, but a separate official designated by the Secretary of Defense for that purpose. He happens to be Vice Admiral retired Bruce McDonald, widely respected former Judge Advocate General of the Navy, who actually testified uh, in the development of the 2009 Act and uh, has uh, had, had a great role in the, the development of the reform system. Military courts, martial, and commissions receive charges through a process known as referral. The process begins when investigation reveals that a crime has been committed by an individual subject to the court's or commission's jurisdiction and is subsequently sworn to under oath by a service member who has knowledge of the alleged offenses. We prosecutors, known as trial counsel, then ensure that charge is forwarded to the convening authority along with a recommendation as to what the disposition of those charges should be. The convening authority, with assistance of counsel from an experienced attorney known as a staff judge advocate under the UCMJ and simply the legal advisor under the 2009 Military Commissions Act, independently reviews the charge to determine if there are reasonable grounds to believe that an offense occurred, that the accused committed it, and that the specification of the charge states an offense under law. If the convening authority determines these things with the assistance of counsel, he then refers the charge for trial. At that point, a military judge is then assigned to preside over the trial of the referred charge or charges. These are well-trained attorneys and members of a state or federal bar with substantial training and experience in criminal trial work specifically. They are insulated from improper influences by the statutory prohibition of such influences that I mentioned, as well as by their assignment to the judiciaries of the services separate from ordinary command channels. And their pay and benefits are based upon rank and years of active service as military officers 
and dictated by law and regulation. The trial subsequently conducted of the referred charge or charges incorporates all of the fundamental guarantees of fairness and justice that are demanded by our values. It also far exceeds the applicable international law standard of common Article Three of the Geneva Conventions in being a regularly constituted court affording all of the judicial guarantees recognized as indispensable by civilized peoples. The accused is presumed innocent. The prosecution must prove each element of every offense, charged offense, beyond a reasonable doubt. And I, I want to leave time for questions uh, so I won't expand on all the rights of an accused in this system. They're listed on page seven. I think we're going to hand out uh, the remarks, which are a little bit built out in some of these areas, because I want to I want to be able to leave time for questions. So who, to whom are the charges then referred? Whom do they get referred to? Well, the heart of the military justice system since ancient times has been a jury of officers whose members have no previous connection either to the charged crime or to the accused person. It's not an accident that the terms court martial and military commission refer in their first and simplest meanings to such juries. I want to spend some time on this remarkable institution in order to demystify it a bit and to lay the foundation for a later exp uh, explanation of its importance to legitimacy. We can trace the origins of the modern United States military jury back in history to at least 1666, when English courts martial were formed with a membership of 13 to incorporate the tradition of common law criminal trials being conducted before a judge and 12 jurymen. This number of 13 was inferred in England's first Mutiny Act of 1689, and then was specifically set forth in successive sets of articles of war passed by the British Parliament and the United States Congress thereafter. The quorum number of 12 plus one was reduced in later acts of Congress, and thus you'll see smaller juries in some of the famous courts martial and military tribunals throughout our history, such as the 1944 court martial of future baseball great, but then Lieutenant Jackie Robinson on charges of failing to obey lawful orders, which is an understandably serious offense in the military. It was a jury of nine army officers who had heard evidence of model soldier Robinson's righteous protest against racial prejudice, which acquitted him of all charges. But the jury number of 12, so that was a jury of nine, uh, it had re been reduced statutorily for non-capital offenses, but the jury number of 12 is still found today in the 2009 Military Commissions Act, where 12 or more officers must unanimous, unanimously vote to convict on a charge punishable by death in order for capital punishment to be imposed. Now, the parallel evolution of the modern United States civilian jury is no less interesting. We know that when the Pilgrims landed in Plymouth in 1620, they brought with them the cherished tradition of trial by jury. And it is sometimes easy to overlook the jury's connection both to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and to the earliest military troops that were quartered here. One of the jury system's defining legends, of course, is the acquittal of seven out of nine British redcoats who were the accused in two different trials following the Boston Massacre of 1770, arguing for a verdict of not guilty and recounting what could and could not firmly be known about the emotionally charged altercation that led five civilians killed. John Adams famously uttered the lines by which countless defense counsel and prosecutors, civilian and military, have since instructed juries on their role. Facts are stubborn things, and whatever may be our wishes or inclin and our inclinations or the dictates of our passions, they cannot alter the state of facts and evidence, Adams said. Today, of course, the Constitution's civilian jury right of those charged with crimes remains a fundamental protection against all manner of tyrannies. The Sixth Amendment guarantees trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed. The specifics of that protection are implemented 
in federal district courts through the Jury Selection and Service Act of 1968 and the plans for random selection of jurors that the act requires each judicial district to develop. The diversity and representativeness of the resulting uh, juries are policed, among other ways, by the federal judiciary through judicial application of the Duran v. Missouri criteria, by which a Sixth Amendment violation is found if representation of a distinctive group, such as gender or race, is not fair and reasonable in relation to the number of such persons in the community, and if the underrepresentation is due to systemic exclusion. A diverse jury is critical to getting at the truth in a way that is legitimate. When you have 12 lay people in a room deliberating, struggling with questions of guilt or innocence and of bias and fairness, you want them to be seeing the evidence and confronting each other about it from a variety of angles. Although the development of United States military juries has never been anchored to the Bill of Rights, recall, for instance, the Fifth Amendment um, exception for cases arising in the land or naval forces. Nevertheless, your armed forces do know something about diversity. And that's not a boast, because history has witnessed episodes of resistance inside and outside of military ranks to making it more representative of wider society even as wiser leaders have pushed for such representativeness because they see its operational importance to fielding the most modern and effective force possible. But that's instead a reflection of insistence by the people of the United States that our armed forces will not be allowed to become a separate caste. To appreciate that insistence, one need only look at the report last March of Congress's Military Leadership Diversity Commission. It reviewed extensive data about diversity dating from President Truman's executive order ending racial segregation in the military, and it outlined specific measures to further improve recruitment of minorities, give them more thorough instruction about advancement within an unprecedented range of modern occupational specialties, and provide greater opportunities to women service members. Thus, while not perfectly representative of society, the population of roughly 200,000 active duty officers from which the convening authority appoints jury members is impressively diverse. And I don't wish to bury a key point here, uh, and it's a difference between civilian juries and military juries. Uh, military members are selected rather than drawn randomly, but they are selected in a process that I would submit yields juries worthy of public confidence. The entrance requirements for able-bodied service as an officer in an all-volunteer force mean that a military commission juror will generally be younger than his or her civilian counterpart, have a college degree, be a resident from any place in the United States rather than from a single community, and be self-selected for service wherever the country requires. And I want to counter somewhat the notion of a homogeneous group. Right here in the audience today, for instance, are Captain Khalil Tawil and soon to be Lieutenant Vanessa Strobe. I know I didn't tell you I was going to mention you, Vanessa, but I'll go ahead and do it. Captain Tawil is a Lebanese American who learned how to speak Arabic in Cairo and is a two time combat veteran infantry officer. Vanessa, a Harvard Law third year student, uh, recently selected for service in the Army's. Judge Advocate General's Corps, might be challenged off a military commission jury duty by one of the parties on that basis, uh, but in hailing from New Mexico, majoring in print journalism and psychology, and captaining her high school varsity track and field team, she has a record that could be one of the many thousands in the military commission's jury pool. Having served on a court-martial as a young infantry lieutenant myself, having spent many years as a trial counsel and as a staff judge advocate, and having had convening authority myself as a general officer in field command in Afghanistan, I know how mindful selecting officials are that diversity and representativeness on military panels serve the interests of justice. Military jurors drawn from units all across the globe are chosen because in the convening authority's independent opinion, 
and this is statutory, these criteria, they are best qualified for the duty by reason of age, education, training, experience, length of service, and judicial temperament. I mentioned challenges a minute ago in the context of Vanessa being connected to the law. Each party has an unlimited number of challenges for cause after having had an opportunity to voir dire the members. No jury member of the armed forces is eligible, I'm sorry, no member of the armed forces is eligible to serve as a juror if she is an accuser, a witness, counsel, or investigator in the case. There are also several other grounds for causal challenge, including that the member has expressed at some point a definite opinion as to guilt or innocence or that a substantial doubt would be raised for any reason as to the commission's legality, fairness, or impartiality. And these challenges for cause are granted liberally by the court to try to ensure there's no suggestion of impartiality. Each party also has a peremptory challenge. Military judges police these rules analogous to the way the federal judiciary polices the rules of the civilian jury system. For instance, since 1988, military courts martial have applied the analysis of Batson v. Kentucky to the exercise of government peremptory challenges in trials by courts martial. Now, when one studies military juries in the modern era, it is harder to conclude that they are more likely to convict or impose harsh sentences. Indeed, the available data though incomplete and subject to hazards in interpretation, are difficult to square with the stereotype of rigid severity. For instance, in the European theater of operations during World War II, 1,672 defendants were tried by the United States Army for law of war violations, resulting in 1,416 convictions and 256 acquittals. And I, Thank most Thrabalos for these data. The conviction rate was 84.7%. Modern data from US courts martial show a conviction rate of 80% based on a study of 3,231 contested trials before military juries between 1988 and 1993, which resulted in 2,576 convictions and 655 complete acquittals. By imperfect comparison, According to the Zabel Benjamin 2009 report on international terrorism prosecutions, there were 214 defendants tried between September 2001, September 11, and 2009 in federal civilian courts, resulting in 195 convictions and 19 acquittals. The conviction rate was 91.1%. The comparison is imperfect, and I don't try to say that it's on all fours. but. Uh, because I don't have precise percentages for the federal prosecutions that were actually heard by juries. And I welcome that data being added to the discussion. And, and a side note is at Nuremberg, 19 Nazi officials were convicted and three were acquitted by civilian judges deciding matters of both fact and law on that international military tribunal. And that was a conviction rate of 84.2%. These data suggest that a defendant has a substantial chance of being acquitted by a military commission, not dramatically different than his chances in these other systems. Meanwhile, results from cases that have gone to trial in recent military commissions also can be interpreted as defying the stereotype of a panel more predisposed to harsh sentences and harsh outcomes of any kind. Salim Ahmed Hamdan received five and a half years uh, for crimes that many federal practitioners believe would have netted him a far more serious sentence in an Article III court. And experienced defense lawyers who have practiced before both civilian and military juries praise military juries' ability to follow the judge's instructions and to do justice. United States reforms undertaken to make military courts more modern and fair are, I believe, best understood as seeking accountability over those who wage war while constraining the arbitrary exercise of power. In the context of the military juries that we've been discussing, this has meant a host of structural arrangements, rules, judicial decisions, and transparency mechanisms to protect the officers deliberating an accused person's fate from being influenced by anything 
other than their duty to do justice. Juries are one of the most important bulwarks against the despotic and arbitrary use of authority ever devised. And they are a part of the genius of American legal institutions, civilian and military. Military juries in the United States have evolved in order to provide a thoroughly American system of justice and discipline for armed forces that while still being trained and commanded to fight effectively, must be modernized to account for, those, for, for who those troops are and for how America and security threats have changed. As Major General John Schofield wrote in a passage that is committed to memory by all who attend West Point, the discipline which makes the soldiers of a free country reliable in battle is not to be gained by harsh or tyrannical treatment. While the differences in procedures today between civilian and military trials are minor compared to their similarities, they can be decisive in a case-intensive analysis undertaken by prosecutors and counter-terror professionals in our interagency community to determine which forum to use. But there are political and now statutory constraints that make military commissions the only option in certain circumstances. And Dan mentioned this at the outset. These constraints are real. They do not render the system unfair. Rather, they exhort us to ensure that those in, the, in, the, that in those situations where military commissions are the only choice, that they are fair and lauded and respected. Under the 2009 reforms, these goals can and should be achieved if we put our minds and energies toward doing so. And I humbly ask you to help me with this, even if you have opposed the course of action that a coordinate elected branch of government has now repeatedly legislated. This has become a matter of the rule of law and of recognizing that at some point justice delayed really is justice denied. And the discussion today of the characteristics of military jur jurors, not only their diversity and independence, but also their training and their sworn duty to uphold the Constitution under adversity and while in personal danger, further suggests that a reformed military commission offers a fair and a just venue. The fact that juries, military and civilian, are intended to do their work away from the public eye raises the issue of compensating transparency in the remainder of the proceedings. Reformed military commissions are closely guided by federal practice regard, uh, uh, requ regarding public access to trials, but Guantanamo is more remote and inaccessible than any federal civilian court. For this reason, military commission prosecutors will continue, as we have done since November of last year, to submit formal motions urging judges to permit closed circuit video transmission of live proceedings to locations in the United States for viewing by victim family members, by the media, and by the public. Also continued will be the practice of prompt internet posting of verbatim unofficial transcripts of proceedings, something not generally available free of charge, and these are free of charge, uh, even in civilian trials. The late Justice Hugo Black's majority opinion in the 1957 case of Reed v. Covert is essential reading for all military lawyers. In that case, the Supreme Court wisely held that a civilian United States citizen and spouse of a service member could not be tried by court martial for crimes allegedly committed during peacetime while serving in England, or while living in England, and her spouse was serving there. Justice Black reasoned in describing a system still seen at the time to be pervaded by unlawful command influence that these tribunals are simply executive tribunals whose personnel are in the executive chain of command and frequently the members must look to the appointing officer for promotions, advantageous assignments, and efficiency ratings. In short, for their future progress in the service." End quote. Justice Black's reasoning extended not only to the members of military jury panels, but also to others with court-martial duties under the recently enacted Uniform Code of Military Justice. 
55 years later, while the role of the military in our constitutional democracy remains a matter of utmost concern, the command influence over military justice proceedings, Justice Black described, has been sharply and properly limited. Under the Military Commissions Act of 2009, the convening authority does not command or supervise the judge, jury, panel members, or counsel, nor would he ever violate a well-understood law by seeking to improperly influence them. Nor are any others seeking to uh, exert an improper influence over this process. To place myself beyond suspicion of self-advancing motives and to offer continuity to the prosecution team through at least the end of 2014, I have, as Dan mentioned, recently requested that this be my last assignment in the military and that I not be considered for promotion and reassignment next year as had been scheduled. But of course, this legitimacy effort is not about me or any other individual. And I cannot stress enough how misguided it is to assume illicit motives or a lack of independent judgment, even in those officers who will stay in the armed forces following their military commission duties. And recall that for jury members, such duties consist usually of a single trial. Your military exists to fight our nation's wars, not to police its streets. We will not seek the duty, but when called upon to try those within our jurisdiction who have violated the laws of armed conflict, we will do so faithfully, transparently, respectful of the various roles within an adversarial and jury-based system, and in accordance with the rule of law. This means, as Justice Jackson said at Nuremberg, staying the hand of vengeance and ensuring that power pays tribute to reason. It means withholding judgment of an accused unless and until he has been found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of specified offenses. And I conclude by proposing that observers, too, should withhold their judgment of reformed military commissions. At least they should do so until they have had a chance to observe a trial firsthand or review a transcript or perhaps read an appellate opinion associated with the trial proceedings. If they do, I believe that they will see a system that is fair and legitimate and deserving of their confidence. Thank you. And I'll be happy to take questions.